Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Inside the Birds TV with Jeff Mosher and Adam Kaplan. And for this edition, it's a Christmas gift to all of the viewers and the readers and the fans because we bring on an Eagles legend. He's one of the best linebackers in Eagles history, three-time Pro Bowler, and you still see him right now. Comcast, Sportsnet's pre- and post-game coverage. He's the man, the myth, Seth Joyner. And Seth is also doing a great podcast called The Seth Joyner Show. It's available on YouTube, drop once a week. Seth was kind enough to have Adam and I appear on his show a few weeks back. So we said, hey, Seth, let's do a home and home. You come on our show after that. So Seth agreed to, and we're uh, re really, really happy to have you, Seth. So thanks for joining us. My pleasure, man. You got it. You got it. Of course, Inside the Birds TV is presented by DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app. Seth, let's get into it. We just saw a game, the Eagles win, a uh, very strange Tuesday night game, 27-17, you know, Adam and I want to focus with you on the defense because there was a there was a time a couple of weeks ago where we thought maybe Jonathan Gannon as a play caller was turning the corner a little bit. We saw some diversity to uh, his pass rush schemes, and Adam and I are kind of perplexed lately about his approach to Jets quarterback um, Zach uh, Wilson, and then of course to Garrett Gilbert, a guy signed you know four days prior by the uh by the washington football team we just thought that there would be much more of an aggressive tone set by jonathan gannon and i didn't wasn't able to catch the show i know you talk about it a lot i would it wouldn't surprise me to hear if you felt the same way about that oh there's no doubt about it there is no doubt about it but you know i after watching um you know 15 games um I, i've just you know resolved myself to the fact that it's just not in it you know, it really isn't in him to be that aggressive. And I asked the question, I really don't know the answer. I, I don't know who it is he cut his teeth under, um, you know, as a defensive coordinator, uh, because a lot of times that has a lot to do with it, you know, and how many different coordinators he's actually, you know, um, you know, been under as well. Because normally what happens is you acquire information over the years of coaching and then you take a little bit from this coordinator and a little bit from this coordinator, and then you combine it and you kind of make it your own. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what's really in the arsenal because they really don't look very complex at all. Um, they really are a defense that really lines up and what you see is what you get. Um, you know, they're a base 4-2 defense. Um, after saying that they weren't a dime team, they kind of evolved into a dime team, you know, the second half of the season. Um, you know, they'll get into their five-man line from time to time, and, you know, they'll bring some pressures off of that. But, you know, Ray Dittinger and I was talking about it last night. You know, there's multiple ways to bring bring pressure. And really what he likes to do if he brings pressure is a zone blitz concept. And the problem with zone blitz is, is that, you know, you've got two defensive ends that are lined up outside or rush backers. And one guy's coming, you're bringing either a linebacker or, or a guy off the edge, and you're dropping one of those guys, one of those defensive ends out that really is not used to playing in that space. Um, so a lot of times when you play, you know, a zone blitz and you're using those guys at the end of the line of scrimmage, they wind up being, um, you wind up vacating a zone because they really don't know what they're doing. Um, you're just replacing the guy. In my opinion, you might as well go man across the board and bring six rather than doing it that way. But it's just not in his arsenal. Um, and I've watched him and I've waited, you know, and I think we had maybe one game this year where he was uber aggressive. Other than that, it's just not in his nature. He just does not want to give up a big play, does not want to take the chance. Would you like to see, because they're actually their man coverage numbers are up, but you know, as you're talking about, they're not, they're still not aggressive enough. What what would you like to see more disguise, more blitzing? What, what would you like to see going forward here? If you could have your druthers? Well, I think a variety of things, you know, it's one thing to play man to man. It's another thing to aggressively play man to man. You know, there was a couple of times um, last night or, or Tuesday night when they were lined up in man coverage, but they were still seven, eight yards off the ball. You, that's not really true man coverage because what you're giving up is the five-yard hitch, the side adjustment that every offense has built in. Um, true man-to-man -man coverage is where, you know, you got a guy up, he's in bump technique. Um, a lot of teams, because when they get in man-to-man, -man, they like to play single high rather than two high um, because personnel dictates that um, they play an outside technique, which, 
is, is like foreign to me. It's it's like mm -hmm. an oxymoron because if you're going to line up outside of a wide receiver, even if you got two on your side, and it's even worse when you only got one to one side, you're giving up the slant all day. You get the outside stem and the slant right now. And that's the easiest pass for a quarterback to complete in, in, in the game. So I would love to see them get up with inside technique um, in man-to-man -man situations. Um, you know, force the issue sometimes, you know, if you're afraid to play too high man coverage, cover two man. Um, but I just think they need to get tighter. Um, you got to get tighter and you got to challenge guys at the line of scrimmage. You got to bump guys, at the, you know, take your jam. I, I see it across the NFL. Guys are afraid, you know, to take the latitude of using that one bump in the five yard area. You know, I, I watch a guy like Travis Kelsey, you know, just rack up yards mm -hmm. all over the place because, you know, you give him free release. Now, free release in zone coverage is a death knell because he is the one tight end that what he does, and my hope is that one day that Dallas Goddard gets here and Jalen Hurts advances enough to create that rapport that Patrick Mahomes has with Jason Kelsey. Jason Kelsey doesn't never has a defined route. You know, all his routes are choice routes. He's going to find a hole in the zone. He's going to sit down. He's going to work away from coverage, and Patrick understands and knows that, and he'll put the ball wherever it is that he needs to put it. Um but with the Eagles, the, the, the issue is they're just not aggressive enough. Um, it, sometimes you, it's all about timing. These quarterbacks love to throw the ball on time and on rhythm. These offensive coordinators, they, they, they develop their, their game plan and their offense based upon the fact that they know that most teams, 95% of the teams in the NFL, will not challenge guys, physically challenge guys at the line of scrimmage or, you know, the cornerbacks won't get up and really in true bump. Um, because it throws off the time in the route. Like if I got a tight end and I got a man to man and I'm lined up on him and I take my shot at the line of scrimmage, if he's the primary, I've just taken him out of the route because when he's supposed to be at 10, he's at seven or eight and the quarterback has to come off him. He cannot wait for him to get to 10. He's got to go to a second read. And that's the benefit of being much more aggressive, you know, and, and chucking guys at the line of scrimmage and even more succinctly when you're playing against you know less experienced quarterbacks man-to-man -man throws are much harder to make than zone zone throws are so in, in that vein seth uh, we know that jim schwartz was not big on blitzing either but he he employed a defensive line scheme that was all aimed at getting to the quarterback and creating that pressure jonathan gannon does not play the same scheme it's not a wide nine here. And he also doesn't blitz a lot, clearly, maybe even less. So is there something, given the scheme he likes to run, that you think he should be doing with the defensive line that would get a little bit more pressure on the quarterback if he's not going to blitz? Well, listen, last night, Tuesday night, I was shocked. I was shocked that, you know, they basically lined up <clears throat> and said, okay, our best is better than yours, whatever it is that you got, and we're just gonna go man, we're just gonna man up. It wasn't until the second half when you begin to see, you know, some stunts up front. Um, Fletcher Cox's first sack um, was off of a stunt. I mean, he rubbed off the end. It was like a delayed um, ET, and he really just kind of fell right into it because the pressure was so was 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 so massive on the inside that the quarterback kind of just fell right to him. But I think that you have to, you can't count on these guys, you know, winning their battles all the time. You know, that's just asking too much. You've got all kinds of stunts at your disposal that you can use and you need to, they need to expand that. Uh, I think one of the reasons why Fletcher Cox sometimes is so disengaged is because he lines up in a three technique 90% of the time and he's trying to beat a guard that um, that knows that his only go is through that B gap. So he could just turn and shield him off. And just as long as he's got good enough feet to keep him from going by, if he can stone him and hit him in the chest, you know, it, he's going to have success. Then other times, you know, when Fletch is hot, you know, they'll, you know, or, or they want to go max protection. They just double him with the center. They slide the center that way. Um or, or they'll come down with the center and the guard and keep the tight end, you know, on a defensive end. And that's one of the things that they must improve upon. 
you know, moving forward is finding defensive ends that can beat tight ends. That's a mismatch all day long. Josh Sweat, um, Derek Barnett, whoever's in there, they have to win those matchups. When you see other defensive ends in this league, they get one-on-ones against tight ends, they destroy them. Our guys are being blocked by tight ends, and that has to change. But a little more diversity in what you do, TEs, ETs, you know, tackle loops, you know, where you crash both um, tackle and end on one side and loop the backside tackle all the way around for contain. All of those things screw up blocking schemes and creates opportunities for guys to, to come free. But if you just ask them to just rush straight up, you know, 90% of the time, guess what? They're not going to win the majority of those battles. Seth, you mentioned Josh Sweat in passing. He signed a pretty big extension, $13 million a year, and he's been had a quiet season. Is there anything you see that would explain why he's not had a season I think we all probably thought he would have? I think he's forgotten, you know, the diversity in his rushes that he had in training camp. I mean, he dominated in training camp. He was the guy that everybody was talking about, and there was a lot of conversation before BG got hurt whether he should actually be the starter over Derek Barnett. That's um, right. But when you watch him rush the pass rusher now, um, you know, even though they don't get in a wide nine, you know, you it, he's in a seven. That's enough space to be able to operate. So he's got to, you know, really go back and look at some of the some of the film from training camp and look at some of the pass rush moves that he used in training camp. I mean, he was he was eating up, you know, everybody on the on the defensive line. I mean, there was nobody that could block Josh Sweat in training camp. And now it seems like, you know, he's either going to speed rush or he's going to try to speed the power. And, you know, you got big, big defensive, big offensive tackles that are smart enough to know that he's only got two pass rushes. So the minute that, you know, he can't get by you, they just sit down on him, you know, and they've got him outweighed. He's only, what, 265, 270 pounds, you know, going against guys that are 320, 330. You know, you're not going to win that battle unless you can get guys moving. Um, But I... I don't know. I, I don't know. I just, I we, I think everyone expected for Josh to have this breakout year. I think the Eagles thought that he would break out. I think that was the genesis of the extension, um, but the production just has not been there. You know, when you were describing some of that athletic movement up front, the twist game, the stunt game, um, it sounded to me like that's a lot of like what the Colts do. The Colts don't blitz a lot. They play a lot of Two, two shell coverages, but they do a whole lot of stuff up front. Mm-hmm. And to your point, that's where Jonathan Gannon was before he came here. So, and we know he was in Minnesota with Zimmer for a while and does some of that disguise deception stuff. So, so Seth, I, I, we, Adam and I have talked about this all year long. We're trying to figure out why we saw some of that stuff in training camp and then it went away. And the only thing I can, and I'm not trying to over rationalize, but there's got to be some kind of logic here to it that he just doesn't trust his personnel yet. These are not his handpicked players yet. Not that he gets to pick his players, but I wonder if if you've watched it and thought maybe if he had the guys that he thinks fits the defense better, he's a different play caller. Well, listen, I, I can I I can understand that. You know, I've been on teams before where you've been under man out the corner, you know, and you do have that reservation about bringing pressure if you don't trust the guys in coverage behind. But I also know that, you know, there are critical times in games where, you know, you just have to send the message in, send it through, you know, your play call. And, hey, you know, we just have to knuckle up on this play. You give me your best. Mm-hmm. Um, there are situations where, see, my, my biggest thing, people think when they hear me talk about blitzing and pressure, you know, that I'm talking about Buddy Ryan style blitzing, mm-hmm. okay? I, I, don't, I don't think we'll ever see that again because the, you know, because of the, um, you know, how, how, you know, prevalent the pass game is and how crafty teams can be. Um, and 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 some of these quarterbacks are so good at pre-snap reads, you know, and once they got their matchup, they know that they're going to win there. Like, you can't show Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady and guys like that what you're doing pre-snap because they'll destroy you. They're going to identify, you know, the, 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 the matchup they want, and they're going to get what they want. Um, but I think that there comes times in, 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 in every single game where, you know, you just got to heat up a guy. It doesn't matter, especially, you know, when you're in third and long. To me, that's the best time to blitz because, you know, the, the difference is if you got third and 15, the conventional wisdom is let's play sticks. Okay, let's get him to throw it underneath. We'll break up. We'll make the tackle. We'll punt the ball. But think about this. 
the technique that he employs when he rent when he runs his his blitzes are corners off. So if I've got third and fifteen, and I can bring one more than they can block, then the quarterback's got one decision and one decision only. And when he makes that throw, my cornerback's off. All he's got to do is break up, make the tackle. We're still off the field, but we minimize how much real estate we give away. Okay, so if you play sticks and you give up 13 on third and 15, we just gave up 13 yards of, of real estate. Because once they punt the ball, sometimes, you know, instead of you getting the ball on the 25 or the 30, you wind up with the ball on the 15 or the 10. Those 13 yards make a major difference because that's the difference between it. your offense only having to make three first downs and being in scoring range and having to make five first downs in order to get in the scoring range, you know? So, but I just, I, I, I get the sense that, you know, it's just not in his nature. Um, maybe I know he trusts Slay. I know he trusts Avanti Maddox. Maybe he doesn't trust, you know, Nelson as much as, you know, everyone thought that he might have. Um, but you still got single high safety in that, in that situation. So you can always lean that safety his way you know, to give him help if if that's an issue, if that's the problem that you have. But in every game, there's a critical time. Like, you know, w when when the Eagles were up in the game, I believe it was 20, um, to, 10? 20, to, 20 to 10. Um, and that drive that, you know, the, the Washington football team had where they scored the seven points. There was a third down in there where I'm like, this is the time to come. You know, yep. you got to you got to cut this off right now and not give them hope that they can make this a one score game. And my goodness, on third down, he played soft and they got a first down, kept the drive alive. Next thing you know, boom, they're in the end zone. Now, you know, it's game on. Now the offense has got to come come on the field and match that to give us the comfort level of, where, of feeling like we've really got control of the football game, because once it went to three points, no one felt like that game was in control. I'm sitting on my seat and I'm like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> Seth, the linebackers, you know, back in your day were anywhere from 240 to 260. Now they're 225, 230, 235. You look at TJ Edwards, Davion Taylor when he plays, you know, he's hurt now, but when he when he plays, he's 225-ish. Could the Eagles win with these guys that you've seen here the last two years, particularly this season? Well, I think Davion Taylor is a player that has tremendous potential. Um, when I look at his skill set, his size, his speed, his aggressiveness, um, his quickness, um, he kind of reminds me of Michael Kendricks. But, hmm. but when you look at both of those guys, you look at guys, you know, I've looked at both of them and, I, and I'm in my mind, I'm saying, wow, you know, they possess skills that I wish I had when hmm. I played, you know. Their speed um, is is the key, um, and Davion Taylor is, I think, probably the best tackler that they have at linebacker, with the exception of maybe T.J. Edwards. Um, T.J. is a guy who I feel like has taken advantage of the opportunity to be a starter. Um, he saw that okay, the door is open, opportunity is there. Let me take advantage of it, and he's played well. But in my opinion, he's a, a passing game liability. Um, you can play him in zone, but you can't play him in man coverage. You know, that's that's a problem. He can't cover backs and he can't cover tight ends. So that's problematic as to how you actually call your defense. Um, I just feel like, you know, they need a difference maker. Um, they need a guy. And, and you know, I'm, I made the comparison, but it's not a full comparison. It's a comparison in theory. You know, when, when the Cowboys drafted Micah Parsons, yeah. I said, this guy is the type of guy that can change the landscape of your defense, okay? Because not from a, a production standpoint, because he hasn't proven it yet, and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not making these comparisons to these two players, but he's Ray Lewis-like, and he's Luke keekley like in that – the way that he plays the game, it raises the level of everybody else on the defense. Because when you turn on the film, you see this guy all over the place. And those other players on the Cowboys defense are watching that same film. And they're looking at it, well, if this young guy is playing at that level, maybe we need to raise our level. 
that's what he brings to the table. That that more than anything, the production is off the charts, but that attitude and the way that he raises the level of everybody else and makes everybody else accountable is what you get in a player like that. That's why you need a player like that on your defense. The Eagles don't have a guy that raises everyone else's level anywhere on the defense. It's hard for a corner to do it. You know, Darius Slay, he's he's a he's a hell of a player within itself. But you got to have an Aaron Donald type or a Ray Lewis type on your defense. And I and I know I get it. They don't grow on trees, but you can certainly go in the draft and find guys you know, that can come in and impact your defense in that manner. Um, Devin White did it for Tampa Bay. Even though they had Levante David and he was a good, great linebacker in his own right, I believe he raised Devante, Devante's level, you know, and you can see these players. So sometimes it's not just about he's a good player and he's a need, let's go get him, but it's how he shifts the entire mindset and the, the, the entire, um, you know, the, 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 um, I guess mindset is the best word that I have for it, how it shifts the mindset of the entire defense. Because, you know, no one wants to look at that film and see a rookie running around making plays just all over the place, flashing the national media is talking about him and being left out. You know, right. everybody wants to raise their level. That's one of the things that made our defense so great because we had a lot of great players. But, heck, if Reggie made three sacks, Clyde won at four. Jerome won at five. You know, if Byron had 10 tackles, I won at 12 or 15. If Andre hmm. had, you know, a forced fumble, Wes won at two. It was healthy competition, but what it did is that kind of competition raises the level of everybody. And if you don't have enough of those players on your defense, it's hard to, it's hard to raise the overall level. Seth, why was Alex Singleton a more productive player in Jim Schwartz's defense than he has been for Jonathan Gannon's defense? I think it's just a mere fact that he 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 had finally arrived to a place we understood what he was doing. You know, I, it, listen, we don't take into account that this team is learning a whole new a whole new defense again this year. Um, so when I watched them play, there's indecision for the linebackers as to where they fit. You know, um, so that's repetition. The more repetition you have at playing the defense, the more it becomes second nature. Like if I'm a if I'm a the the weak side linebacker and under, okay, play side, I know I got B gap right now. Anything come to B gap, I'm B gap. You know, even if that lineman comes out on me, I got to rip through his outside head and I got to hold across his face and I got to hold that B gap. Okay, anything away, I know that I'm front side A gap to full flow, okay? Now, it took me two years of running that defense to understand for that to be automatic, you know? So when you look at these linebackers, the biggest question is, what are your eyes? What are you looking at? What's your key that tells you, A, whether it's run or pass, okay? Did you pre-program in your mind, pre-snap, I got this on run, I got this on pass, if it's flow to me, I got this gap. If it's flow away, I got this gap. Those types of things you have to you have to pre-program them in your mind. When I'm in the huddle and the players call, okay, I got this on run, I got this on pass. Flow to me here, flow. So now I've already preset it. So the minute the ball is snapped and I got my read, the minute I get my read and it tells me what the play is, run or pass, flow to me, flow away. It's reactionary, you know. So for these guys until they get to a point where it's reactionary. And I think that in Jim Schwartz's defense, it had become rea reactionary for him last year. In this defense, not so much. Not any of these linebackers. Seth, as an overview of this football team, coming into the season, looking at where they are now after 14 games, 7-7, seven and seven, do you, were they better than you thought, right where you thought they'd be, or a little, bit, or a little worse than you thought they'd be? You know, and that's such a hard question because, you know, going into the season, what we what we witnessed in week one, I think everyone was hopeful yeah. that, you know, yeah. that things were going to be better than they actually were. Um, then you take into account um, what you saw offensively the first seven weeks, the first, the, you know, weeks one through six. You know, to me, it was an, an abomination because 
if they had if they had employed what they did from week seven to the present, you know, they're five and two over the last seven games. If they would have played and they rushed for for over 200 yards in five games, 175 yards in, you know, seven games. If they had done that out the gate and developed Jalen Hurts the proper way with the running game, I think the Eagles would they would be sitting in the five the five the four or five seed, you know, as we speak. We may roll into week 18 with the Eagles and the Cowboys game being for the division, mm. you know, but because they did it backwards from an offensive perspective. And defensively, they, they just didn't play aggressive enough against the quarterbacks that they needed to. You know, they find themselves where they are. Um, so it's a hard question to answer because it's, you know, it's if they would have done that, they could be here. But because sure. they didn't, this is, this is where they are. So, you know, are the expectations real or are they kind of fake because, you know, they just didn't do things the right way? Well, it's going to be a fantastic finish here over the last three games, Seth. We know that. It'll be pretty wild with all these division games. We know you'll be locked in with Ray Diddy and Mike Barkan and everybody at CSN there, Barrett Brooks. Uh, who's coming up next on the next Seth Joyner show, and when does it come out? You know, I don't even know because, you know, with this scramble with the schedule um, this past week, you know, the game was on Tuesday. We normally do the show on Tuesday. Um you know, so everything got screwed up. I was supposed to fly in Saturday and, you know, three hours before I left, all of a sudden mm. the game is moved to Tuesday. So then I flew mm. in on Sunday instead and it, it just, everything screwed up. So I'm, I'm kind of working through that right now. We're going to take this week off and, you know, next week come back with a show. Um, it'll be, a, it, it'll be a good one because, you know, I think next week's game is going to be a big game. I'm looking forward to see if, seeing if um, Jalen Hurts can parlay, you know, the last three quarters into this game and, you know, looking to see, you know, if the, if the defense can continue to play at the level that they're playing, that they've got to win, you know, at least two out of the, the last three. And and if Dallas is locked into the two spot already or they've already secured the one spot, it's highly likely, you know, that might be a game that they can win as well because they'll be resting players. There we go. Well, we'll see, and we'll cross our fingers. Maybe we'll see some pressure against Jake Fromm from the Giants quarterback. Maybe we'll see some blitzing. Can't guarantee it, but we'll <laughs> all be waiting to see if that's the guy that Jonathan Gannon decides he's going to bring pressure against. Seth, have a great holidays. Merry Christmas. Can't thank you enough. It's been great catching up with you. Uh, I feel like we see you all the time because you're on you know, so many shows on CSN, but you're doing a great job, and we really appreciate you jumping on with us. My pleasure. Anytime, guys. You know it. Uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Hello, Philadelphia. Merry Christmas. And uh, looking forward to a good finish. Awesome. Awesome. We will do it again. All right. Thanks, everybody. For Adam Kaplan, for Seth Joyner, I'm Jeff Mosher. You've been watching Inside the Birds TV. We'll catch you on the next one.